I now recognize Mr. Bilirakis for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. Uh, again, uh, thanks for holding the hearing, the legislative hearing, to examine Medicaid and ensure program integrity and targeted help for individuals who are often the most in need, uh, children, low-income seniors, and those with disability. Republicans are also pushing back on significant overreach from this administration and its attempts to federalize the Medicaid program into a one-size-fits-all approach that will harm patients' access to care, in my opinion. We should reject policies that further this overreach and instead empower states and providers. That's why I'm uh, in support of Representative Kamek's H.R. 8114 legislation that prevents CMS from finalizing its 80-20 rule. That would be catastrophic for Americans that rely on long-term services, especially now, uh, and supports an increase, uh, increase the shortage of workers we already have. So we've got to be careful. The staffing issue is, uh, is a real problem particularly in the state of Florida. Among our other proposals are common sense bipartisan solutions such as uh, Representative Miller Meeks' HR 8111 that ensures streamlined updates of Medicaid beneficiaries' address information, and Chair Rogers' HR 8106, which allows states to provide home and community-based service options for those that don't meet an institutional level of care. Vital, vital. Uh, quality of care, quality of life is so very important for our seniors. As well as my bill, H.R. 8084, the leveraging integrity and verification of eligibility for Beneficiaries Act. This bipartisan bill I lead with Representative Craig will address concerns that many states repeatedly have made uh, improper capitation payments to managed care organizations after enrollees had died. So this is a real issue, folks. This is a no-brainer policy, in my opinion, and yet it's a serious issue, very serious issue, since we know there's also a lot of fraud that can and does occur. Uh, Mr. Sai, I wanted to thank you for your uh, recent state Medicaid uh, director letter sent last week that, that addresses these concerns with deceased beneficiaries remaining enrolled in the Medicaid program. Uh, as you know, this was also a subject of the oversight hearing in this committee a few weeks ago as well. In the letter, you noted that the identification that a beneficiary is deceased should be considered as a, and I'll quote, potential change in circumstance, and that states must conduct a redetermination of eligibility. Uh, about how long would that redetermination process take for a state to confirm that someone is in fact deceased? Well, thanks for that question and thanks for your focus on that topic and program integrity. Um, I want to just start by saying we uh, agree very much, not only is program integrity and fiscal stewardship important, Medicaid should not be paying uh, capitation uh, premium payments to Medi Medicaid managed care plans should not be paid with Medicaid dollars. We have clear rules that say we recoup funding, and so uh, you referenced the letter we put out last week. I would note, um, with respect to the provisions you're noting, one important thing that I would know we all agree with is uh, as states and managed care plans are doing data matches to help identify if someone is deceased, number one, we just want to make sure those are Correct. Obviously, sometimes a data match happens and you think someone is deceased and the worst thing would be to send a letter to say your husband is deceased and disenrolled from the Medicaid program when it was, a, it was due to a, to a data error. And so we work with states to make sure they can do that, um, but do that as quickly and efficiently as possible. Okay. So uh, the, the, the death master list is considered to be highly accurate by the Office of Inspector General. Uh, and they believe that the likelihood of false positives where someone who is alive is reported in the database is near zero. Uh, so do you think it's prudent that states should be required to pay for at least one, if not multiple, per member, per month payments to Medicaid managed care organizations when they know that someone is already dead? So they were, they're, they're, yeah, it's, if you could answer that question, I'd appreciate that. Sure, and as I noted, um, we agree that it, 
not only is fiscal integrity important, we, as I said, Medicaid capitation payment should not be paid out for that. And states have a strong incentive <clears throat> to do this as quickly as possible because they know if we audit, if we identify or OIG or GA audit, we go recoup that funding from the states and so they are on the hook. And so there's a strong incentive from states to utilize um, a range of files. Sometimes the data match is not just the issue um, with the death master file itself, it is with matching between the data set that the state has to that and making sure that that is accurate. And again, no one wants to get a letter in the mail that says somebody has deceased when they've not actually. Um, and so there are pieces there, but we ask states to do that as quickly and efficiently as possible. Oh, very good, thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Recognize Ms. Pedagon for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Sy, for your work and for being here today. Uh, I want to echo uh, that uh, Medicaid serves as a vital safety net uh, that provides essential health care coverage to millions of low-income Americans, including about 12 million Californians, uh, where my district is. Uh, we have seen over 20 million people uh, been disenrolled from Medicaid after the continuous coverage requirements expired a year ago and many of those uh, were disenrolled for procedures